Hi, everyone, and welcome to this advanced webinar on change detection for land cover mapping. My name is Cindy Schmidt, and I will be your instructor today. So this webinar series consists of two two-hour sessions, uh, on, one on Friday, September 28th today, and one next Friday, October 5th. So that we're also going to have two sessions each of those days, a session A and a session B. Those sessions are exactly the same thing, so you only need to sign up for one of those sessions. The webinar recordings, the presentations, and the one homework assignment that we're going to have can be found after each session at, the, at our website listed here. And then also after each session, there will be a Q&A. Um, and then you can also have additional, give us additional questions via email at um, my email address here or my colleagues, Amber McCollum, um, during the week. We'll have one homework assignment. Answers have to be submitted via Google Form, and that will be given to you at the end of the second webinar. So in order to get a certificate of completion, you have to attend both live webinars and complete the homework assignment, which is due October 19th. You will receive your certificate about two months after the completion of the course, um, from Marinas Martins listed here. So we have a few prerequisites for this course because it's an advanced course. The first one is to make sure that you have viewed our Fundamentals of Remote Sensing webinar series, which you can view anytime from our website or at least have taken a remote sensing class. We also require that you've taken um, the advanced webinar, Land Cover Classification with Satellite Imagery, because we will be doing a land cover classification um, during the second webinar. We also require that you download and install QGIS and all accompanying software. We have some R um, scripts that we have you download. Um, you can use this exercise, there's a link there that you can use for help in downloading and installing QGIS if you haven't done so already. You will also need to down, download and install the R statistical program and then also download and install R Studio. You can access all our course materials on our website. Um, the web page is listed here. It has the recordings. Um, it will have the link to the homework, and it has the exercises and all associated material with those exercises. This is our course outline for this week and next week. Session one will be an introduction to change detection, and then session two, we will show you how to do a change detection using classification approach. Since it is an advanced webinar series, both, both sessions will include exercises in QGIS. So you will need to have QGIS loaded for this week's exercise. This week, I'm going to give you an overview of change detection, then describe different methods for detecting change with satellite imagery. Then I will do an exercise on how to visualize change two different ways in QGIS. So I'll first start with the overview of change detection. Detecting change in satellite imagery generally refers to the conversion of the landscape from one dominant feature type to another. Examples of that include changes in tree cover due to wildfire or land clearing, urbanization and land degradation due to overgrazing. The type of information you can get from satellite imagery is where and when has change taken place, how much and what kind of change has occurred, and what are the cycles and trends in the change. There are several broad categories of change that you can detect with satellite imagery. Those include cha the change in shape or size of patches. Urbanization is a great example of that. 
slow changes in cover type um, is a little more difficult to detect than abrupt changes due to wildfire or deforestation. Slow changes in the condition of a single cover type like forest degradation due to insect or disease can be easy or difficult depending on the extent of the damage. Lastly, changes in the timing and extent of seasonal processes such as decreased rainfall and its effects on vegetation can be monitored using satellite imagery. The way we detect change using satellite imagery is by detecting changes in the spectral values of pixels. Pixels will have different values before and after changes have occurred. In this example, we see that healthy vegetation has high reflectance in the near infrared, but low in the shortwave infrared. Burned areas are the opposite, with low reflectance in the near infrared and higher in the shortwave infrared. So you can use that information to not only detect burned areas, but also detect, de de detect the severity of the burn. The goals of detecting change in satellite imagery include identifying the location and type of change, quantify the change, and assess the accuracy of the results. It's important to understand that identifying the location of and quantifying change is pretty easy. Identifying what caused the change is not easy. And I'll be um, reiterating that over the course of our webinar series, that it again, it's easy to detect the change, the location of the change, when the change occurred, and sometimes the severity of the change. Identifying the cause of the change is much more difficult. The key to successfully detecting change is to separate real change from spectral differences that are due to other factors, such as images from different seasons. So you need to choose images that are collected at approximately the same time of day, collected during the same season, nearly cloud-free, hopefully, co-registered with one another, and radiometrically and atmospherically corrected. I can't stress this point enough that the key to detecting change is to detect the actual change, not, not any kind of spectral differences due to pick, difference in pixel values because of atmospheric differences and so on. Um, this, is, this is really the key to getting at identifying change. Images need to be collected about the same time of day to reduce differences in sun, in sun angles. Ideally, images from different years should be within the same month to avoid seasonal and phenological differences. For example, if you choose an image in the dry season and an image in the rainy season, assuming you can actually find one cloud-free, then you will be seeing differences in vegetation greenness due to different, different precipitation amounts, not due to land cover change. Similar to this, even if you choose images from the same time of year, you need to be aware of different annual precipitation amounts for those particular years. If one year experienced extreme drought and one year experienced normal rainfall, you will be seeing differences in vegetation amount due to their differences in rainfall. Now, if that's what you're interested in looking at, then that's fine. But if you're looking at, say, deforestation, you have to be aware that you're going to see changes in uh, vegetation due to those rainfall amounts as well. You can currently acquire Landsat surface reflectance products for Landsat 4, 5, and 8. These products are generated using the Landsat Ecosystem Disturbance Adaptive Processing System, or LEADAP, which was developed by scientists at NASA Goddard as part of the Measures Project. The USGS now maintains the system and provides these products via, via the Earth Explorer data portal listed here. So there are a few caveats uh, to using the surface reflectance products. Um, one is that the Landsat 7 images are not gap filled. Um, and the usefulness of using these products is reduced in certain areas such as very hyper-arid areas or snow-covered regions, um, 
air, conditions where there's low sun angle, um, coastal regions, and then ex areas with extensive clouds. The um, panchromatic band, um, so the Landsat 7 band 8 is not available um, in the surface re reflectance product. And the product for Landsat 4, 5, and 7 are only available for specific dates. Actually, they're, they're available for most dates, um, and we'll give you a website where you can see the exact dates that they're available. They're, they are not available for a few dates um, that they list on their website. So next, I'll be describing some of the change detection methods. There are lots of different kinds of ways to detect change in imagery. I'll be telling you about four of them, visual analysis, classification approaches, image differencing, and temporal trajectories. Visual interpretation involves the delineation of change on a computer screen rather than a paper map. This allows production of results that are automatically in digital form. The method works best if image analysis tools and experiences are limited but it doesn't take full advantage of spectral responses, and it's not good for subtle changes like land degradation. So the images on the right show how deforestation in Peru between July 2013 and February 2015 was delineated. So we call that also heads up digitizing, where you just have the image on the screen and you're digitizing a polygon around the areas um, that you're wanting to analyze change. And you generally can use uh, GIS software or some image processing software to do that. The two main classification approaches are post-classification comparison and classification of multi-date imagery. In post-classification comparison, two dates of imagery are classified separately and then one date is subtracted from the other. This approach is not recommended because the final change map will reflect errors from each classification. Also, this approach tends to ignore subtle changes that occur within a class. In the classification of multi-date imagery approach, you stack two dates of imagery into one file and then you classify the two-date image. So that's what we'll be doing next week. You can also include image transformations, such as um, NDVI, the vegetation index, to help identify subtle changes. The result is that you will get an image where the class changes will be unique. This approach is recommended because it uses the raw pixels to identify change, and it can detect subtle changes. Um, the challenge to this approach is that sometimes it's difficult or at least challenging to interpret. The image subtraction method works by simply taking a single band from two dates of imagery and subtracting one from the other that results in a change image. The change image consists of positive and negative values where change has occurred and zero values where no change has occurred. The advantage to this approach is that it also can detect subtle changes, but again, it may be difficult to interpret. So we'll be doing this approach in today's exercise. Calculating the difference normalized burn ratio to assess burn severity is a good example of image differencing between image transformations of two dates. This approach involves first calculating the normalized burn ratio for each image date and then subtracting the post-fire NBR image from the pre-fire NBR image. Recent developments in change detection methods take advantage of the entire freely available Landsat archive by using monthly or annual time series to look at changes or trends. While in the previously described method, you would only use two or three image dates, in this method, you could use 20 or 30 or more image dates. This method allows the capture of short duration disturbance events as well as long-term disturbance trends. 
This approach is founded on the recognition that change is not simply a comparison between conditions at two points in time, but rather a continual process operating at both fast and slow rates on the landscape. There are several different algorithms um, that are out there, and this is an example of land trender developed by Kennedy et al. at Oregon State University. The results of this algorithm include the magnitude of change that identifies the percent of tree cover loss, the duration of the disturbance, and the year of onset of the disturbance. RSET plans to do an advanced webinar of, on image time series analysis in 2019, so stay tuned for that one. So next I'm going to give you a few case study examples of how satellite imagery is used for looking at change. This example shows how you can clearly see some types of extreme changes like mountaintop mining in West Virginia. These images show the elimination of vegetation for mining operations between 1984 and 2015. The resulting rock debris piles have increased sediment sedimentation in nearby rivers. Fan et al. used a vegetation index differencing approach to map rub plantations. This is a little different than analyzing change between two time periods. It identifies rubber plantations by taking advantage of two distinct phen phenological stages, leaf off and full foliation. These two distinct stages enable identifi identification of rubber plantations compared to the surrounding vegetation. This approach could then be used to look at the expansion of rubber plantations over time. This example shows the changing land use and land cover in a watershed in southwest China between 1974 and 2008. This study used the post-classification and comparison approach, which will not capture subtle change, but as you can see, it does capture broad land cover changes. It is also easy to quantify the changes with this approach. Next, I'm going to show you some web tools that you can use to do change detection and analysis. We've talked about Global Forest Watch in previous webinars, but we did want to show you this again because such a, it's such a great uh, web tool for looking at uh, forest cover change. It's an interactive online forest monitoring and alert system designed to empower people everywhere with the information they need to better manage and conserve forest landscapes. It provides information about the status of forest landscapes, including tree cover gain and loss, which most people use it for, land cover, land use, conservation, population density, and then you can also get country-specific data. The tree cover loss and gain product uses Landsat at a 30-meter spatial resolution from 2001 to 2015, although I think that's um, been updated to 2016 recently. It shows the location and amount of disturbance, but not the cause. So again, it's easy to get at location um, of disturbance and how much disturbance, but it's really challenging to get at the cause of disturbance unless you have some good ground data. In this example, we're zoomed into the DRC to look at to look more closely at the area of tree cover loss in that country. If you click on the purple country data tab on the far right, you can type in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and then you can click on Analyze to obtain specific country metrics that will show up on this panel on the right. Here you can see that from 2001 to 2015, there was over 9 million hectares of forest loss in that country. You can also download the data directly from the map viewer. So it's a really great resource for examining forest cover change. I also wanted to let you know about appears. We've, dis we've discussed appears in previous webinars as well. Um, it's a great resource for really looking at MODIS 
um, imagery and looking at sort of changes over time and getting statistics about various modus products. Landsat will be incorporated into this, into a peers um, at some point, but it's not there yet. So you can get um, a peers through the LP DAC, um, and we'll give you that um, website a little bit later. Um, so outputs not only include the actual data, but you can get um, you can you can get the imagery itself, but you can also get the data in CSV form for easy analysis. And they also have these really nice plots that they do, um, as you can see in the lower right, um, that will give you they'll give you those plots automatically. So as part of our time series anal analysis webinar that we'll do in 2019, we will include some exercises on using a peers. I also wanted to mention another system called CPAL, System for Earth Observations, Data Access, Processing, and Analysis for Land Monitoring. This also has some really great cloud-based um, tools for doing uh, two date change detection and also time series analysis. Uh, you do have to get an account to access these tools, um, but it's pretty easy to do. Um, and it's developed by the, uh, by the FAO. So I highly recommend that you take a look at this website as well. So at this point, we're going to jump into doing an exercise on visualizing change using QGIS. So just bear with us for a moment while we switch over to um, bringing up QGIS. All right, everyone, let's get started with our exercise now. You should all have a copy of the um, exercise downloaded from our website. So you can either follow along with me um, and try to actually do what I'm doing. I, but if I'm going too quickly, what I recommend is that you just watch um, and then do it at your own speed using our exercise a little bit later. It, it's fairly straightforward, but um, in case I I speed too, um, too fast through this, then um, I recommend that you just try it a little bit later. So for this exercise, you see QGIS up. We're going to be looking at vegetation changes in Tanzania from 1993 to 2016, again, using two different visualization techniques. So for the first image in 1993, we have a Landsat 5 image. And then for the 2016 image, we have a Landsat 8 image. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to add those images to um, QGIS. And when you download these images from Earth Explorer, the images come, each band is in a different file. So we'll have to load each band uh, separately, and then we'll have to stack them together in order to, to process the data. The other thing I wanted to let you know is I am using the newest version of QGIS. So if you have an older version of QGIS, you will notice thing, there, there are some differences in terms of um, how things look and how, how you do things. You, you can still figure out how to do it using the older version. All the functions are still there. They just may look a little bit different. So uh, just to give you a warning about that. And the first thing that's actually quite different about this new version is that um, loading raster data sets is, is a little different. So if you click on the icon for loading the raster data along the panel along the side, this um, data source manager will come up. And here it says it's looking for what raster data set you want to choose. So I'm going to click on the dots on the side. And I'm going to add the Landsat 5, the 1993 band. So as you can see, I have them all listed here. Everything's in there. There's a lot when you order the surface reflectance data, 
they have a lot of sort of quality bands um, and a lot of other information um, that you can use to do things like cloud masking um, and looking at your data quality. But right now we're just going to load the bands that are there. So it's um, one, bands one, two, three, four, five, and seven. Band six um, for Landsat, five is the thermal band. We won't be needing that band. So you open all three of those and then add them. And then I'm going to close this for now. So now all the bands, it looks a little funky. We'll, we'll work with the display a little bit later. But what we want to do is actually um, stack these bands into one file. So in order to do that, you go up to raster, then miscellaneous, and then merge. We're going to be using this function quite a bit through this exercise. So we're going to add our input layers. Um, the nice thing is when you use the merge function that even though your um, bands aren't in necessarily in the right order when you load them, as you can see, I have seven at the top and one at the bottom, it will put them in the right order during um, in the merge function. So has all the bands there, one through one through five and seven, we just want to select them all and say OK. This, the one really, really important thing that you do when you use the merge function is click this guy right here. Place each input file into a separate band. I can't tell you how many times I've forgotten to do that. Um, and then you don't get the results that you want. So make sure you click that when you're merging multiple bands together. Then we're going to want to give it a file name. So in order to do that, uh, you click on the three dots here. We're going to save it to a file. I'm going to navigate to my exercise one. And we're going to call it Tanzania1993.tiff. So I actually already have um, an image called Tanzania 1993. So I'm um, going ahead and cancel this. But what you'll do um, is create that image here. You click run in background and then you close. And it will run it. And what will happen though is you'll get a temporary file called merge appear in your. Um, legend here in your layers and you'll want to br just make sure you display your 1993 image that you just created so i'm going to do that right now and i'll add that okay so i have a multi-band 1993 image um, right there it's the the colors are still um not the way we want them, but we'll change that as soon as we stack the 2016 image. So I'm going to bring up the 2016 band, and that's the Landsat 8. So there's a few different bands, if you remember, in Landsat 8. Um, and so it's something you need to keep in mind when we're doing some of the vegetation indices that the bands are a little bit different. So I'm going to select again band one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And we'll open that and then we'll add them and close. And again, we'll want to merge this. So we would go through the same process of miscellaneous merge. We select our Landsat 8 bands here. So we have, um, you can see Landsat 8 at the top. We select them all and then say, OK, save them to a file that we call Tanzania2016.tif. Uh, and then we run that. 
and I'm just going to bring up, since I already did that, I'm just going to bring up that image, Lent, um, the Tanzania 2016, if I can find it. There it is. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is make our image look a little bit better. I'm going to close everything up so we can see things. I'm going to move a Tanzania 1993 above the 2016. We'll get rid of all the other images in a little bit. Um, but there's one thing we need to do before we do that. Um, but before, but I'm gonna click off also, I'm gonna click off all these other ones because we don't need to be looking at the individual bands. Okay, so for 1993, I'm gonna right click and then go to properties. And then the properties dialog comes up. So in order to make this image look a little bit nicer we're going to select it says multi-band color here and then we want to um, put band five which is the mid infrared band in the in the red band we want to put band four which is the near infrared band in the green band and then we can leave band three um in the uh blue band and then if we say apply you can see that the image looks a little bit better i'm going to move it aside a little bit so you can see it but we can actually make it look a little bit nicer too because the colors are actually being affected by the background because we didn't indicate what the background is as well as the clouds that you can see in the imagery so what I'm going to do, actually I'll close this, I'm going to zoom in to an area that doesn't include the clouds, something like that. It doesn't have to be perfect, but I'm going to make sure, actually what I'll do is zoom in a little bit more. Okay, that's close enough. There's a few clouds in it, but that's okay. I just don't want the background in there either. Okay, so if you right click on Tanzania again, 1993, you click on properties, um, it has 543 in there. Well, what we want to do is click on the min max value setting and select mean plus or minus standard deviation of two. And then under statistics extent, instead of saying whole raster, we want to do the current canvas. So that's just going to look at the statistics within this canvas, and then we say apply. And now you'll see a huge difference in terms of what the image looks like, and I'll click OK. And I'll zoom back out to the whole image, and you can see how different it looks. You can still see a lot of clouds in there, um, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. But you can see a lot more contrast between the areas that are vegetated and not vegetated. I, I like this um, band combination that uses the mid-infrared band because it, it really allows you to look at things a little bit differently. But please feel free to use your own um, band combination that you prefer. Now I'm gonna do the same thing to um, the 2016 image. I'm gonna to go to properties. Actually, what I'm gonna do is zoom in to begin with. I'm just gonna zoom in right off the bat here. I'm gonna to go to Tanzania 2016. Remember, this is a Landsat heat image. So instead of doing 543, we're gonna do 654. So band six in the red band, band five in the green band, band four in the blue band. We'll click on the min max settings. Again, select mean, plus or minus standard deviation. And instead of the whole raster, we'll select current canvas and then click apply. And, and you'll see 
the same sort of contrast in this image that we saw in the 1993 image. So I'm going to zoom back out to the whole image. Now, if you do a quick sort of comparison of the images, so these are the exact same location, you will see, you'll automatically already see some differences in the vegetation. Um, and so we're going to be narrowing down our analysis to a particular area in this image. Um, one, to sort of avoid the clouds, but two, so you can um, really see some of the vegetation change that's, that's going on in this image. So it, we're going to clip it, clip the image to, um, to a smaller area. And in order to clip the image, we'll go to raster at the top here, extraction, and clip raster by extent. So the first image we'll clip is the 1993 image. So make sure it's selected here. Tanzania 1993. There it is. And we've already identified what the um, coordinates are for this clipping extent. Um, so you'll need to look at your exercise, your written exercise for the exact numbers, but I'm going to type them in here. So the coordinates are three, four, two, three, seven, five, and then comma for the next one, three, nine, three, two, five, five, and then another comma, and then a negative, one, 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 three, two, five, five, and then a comma, and then a negative, one, zero, six, eight, one, three, five. You can also draw a box. It allows you to draw a box if you want to. But since we want to do the exact same clip for both images, um, we're just going to use these, these coordinates. And then you're going to want to save it um, again to not a temporary file, but a save it to a file and call it, and this particular image will be called Tanzania 1993 underscore clip um, dot tiff. So as you can see, I have already done that. So I'm just going to cancel this. Um, you'll run it in the background. And then again, a temporary image will show up um, in your layer. So you'll have to display the clip image. Um, so I'll do that now. Bring up. 1993.clip is right there. We'll open it up and we'll add it and close this. And we'll show you what it looks like here. Oh, let me put it in the top. Sometimes it doesn't want to go in the top. There we go. So you can see the area here that we clip. The colors, again, are a little um, not exactly what we want, so we'll change the colors in a minute. But you can see the area that we're going to be focusing on. So the next thing we'll have to do is um, clip the 2016 image. So again, we go to Foster Extraction, Clip. Um, and what you can do is you can actually use um, an existing layer. And you can pick your clipped image um, to clip to that area. So that makes it a little faster where you don't have to type in the coordinates. And then again, you're going to save it to a file here, and we'll call it Tanzania 2016 underscore clip, which I've already done. So I'm going to bring that one up. And there it is. So I'll open that, and then we'll add it. OK, so now we have two clipped images. I'm going to zoom in. 
And again, it looks, I'm going to put the 1993 on the top. Um, so the colors are a little weird. So let's just go back and change them to something that looks a little nicer. Again, we'll go, um, we don't have to worry about the clouds of the background on this one. So we can just do our standard deviation if we want and apply it. Oops, we have to get our bands right. That's the important thing here. So we need five four and three um, and then apply and there we go I'll move it aside there it looks a lot nicer now and we'll do the same for 2016 except for remember that we want band uh, six five and four We'll do apply, and there we go. So just take a look at these images for a minute. Right now we have 1993 showing on top, but if I click that one off, you'll see you'll see two things. You'll see a lot of areas where there was no vegetation in 1993 so those are the pink areas um but then became vegetated in 2016 and then you'll see a lot of the opposite too where you see vegetated areas that are green in 1993 but then became unvegetated in 2016. so what we're going to show you is ways to um, in one image ways to make each of those kinds of changes really, really pop out. So the first thing we're going to do is we're just going to look at a single band of um, imagery for each date and actually put those bands together into one image. Um, and this is sometimes a, a quick and dirty way to look at, to look at change. Um, unfortunately with QGIS, it doesn't make it quite so quick, but other software packages allow you to do it um, a little bit, a little bit easier, but I wanted to show it to you anyways, because it's a really great way to, to visualize change. So for, this um, part of the exercise, we're only going to be using the near infrared band for each year. So for the Landsat 5, that's band 4, and for the Landsat 8, um, that is band 5. So we'll want to uh, clip the band 4. I'm going to go to raster extraction. Again, clip by extent. Okay, and I'm going to pick a uh, band four from Landsat five, which is right here. I'm double checking to make sure I get it right. Landsat five, band four. Okay, and then your clipping extent is going to be the same as the 1993 image. So then you can use the layer canvas extent. You can clip, you can select your clipped image. And then you can give it a name. And we will call it tan 1993 underscore, uh, I call it B4, or you can put band4 underscore clip.tiff. So you'll put that here in the clipped part. Um, and then you'll run it in the background. So I already have that done. So I'm just going to display it now and show you what it looks like. I just got to find it now. Here it is. So tan1993 b4 band4 underscore clip. I'm going to open it and add it. Okay, so that's just the near for red band. Um, I'm gonna turn off the all the bands, and so that's what it looks like. It's just a, 
a gray level since it's only a single band. So we're going to do the same. Basically, you do the same thing for uh, band five for the Landsat 8. And I'm going to bring that one up. I won't show you how to do that again since you all know how to do uh, flip now. One thing I noticed is I actually gave it the wrong um, label. 2016, TAN 2016, I said underscore band four, but it's really band five. So I apologize for that. Um, underscore clip, but it truly is band five. I just gave it the wrong name. Okay, so we'll add that one too. So now what we have to do is we have to merge those two images together. So we've done merge before. Again, it's raster miscellaneous merge. And we're going to select those two bands. The, they both say band four, but one should say band five. These two bands right here, 1993 first. Actually, what we want is the 2006 first because um, you can do either way, but it just makes it a little easier. And that's what we have described in this exercise. So you can actually move this up. So 2016 is first. So you select these two and then say, okay. So those two are selected. Make sure that you click this right here, place each input file into a separate band. It's very important that you do that. And then um, we're going to give it a name. And we're going to call it NIR underscore 2016 underscore 1993 underscore clip. So I've already done that. And I will display that now. Hopefully I gave it the right name. Here it is. NIR underscore 2016 underscore 1993 underscore clip. So that's our merged near infrared files into one file. And we'll say add. Okay, now it looks a little weird because um, there's two bands in there, so, so there's some color. But we're going to um, display the band so you can interpret the color a little bit. So we're going to Go to Symbology on your clip image. So you right click again, go to Properties um, and Symbology. And we're, it's, we say multi-band colors. And now what we're going to do is in the red band, we're going to put band two, which is the 1993 near infrared band. In the green band, we're going to put band one, which is the 2016 near infrared band. And then in the blue band, we're going to put band two again. And you'll see why we're doing this um, in a minute. Now, what happens is, if you notice, even if you were to click apply, that there's no values in the blue band right here. So what we'll need to do is just copy what's in the blue band up here into the blue band down here. So the minimum is 1989.03, and the maximum is 2918.84. Um, and then we can go ahead and click mean and standard deviation. That's fine. And we click apply. And now our image is going to look really different. So what we see is a lot of purple and green and gray. So what does this mean? What this means is that everywhere you see purple, there's been a decrease in vegetation between 1993 and 2016. And everywhere you see green, there's been an increase in vegetation between 1993 and 2016. And all the gray areas in there are, is basically no change. And the lighter the color, the less the change. So this actually gets that um, you know, amount of change to some degree. So for example, if we if we zoom into an area where there's Let's say a lot of, we can do a lot of green and purple. I'm going to zoom in down here. 
Okay. I'm going to turn off some of these other images. I'm going to bring, actually, I'm, I'm going to bring Tanzania 2013 down here if I can. There we go. I'm actually going to get rid of these two. We're getting a lot of images in here that we don't need now. Okay. And we don't need this one too. Okay, so as you can see in the uh, near infrared image right now, we see a lot of green where the vegetation has increased between the two years. And we can confirm that by looking at the 1993 image where you see in that area, there is no vegetation, it's all pink. And then by 2016, in this area is green. So it, the vegetation um, has increased in those particular areas. And likewise, if you look, well, let's go to another area. Let's go to an area that has a little more purple in it. So let's say in here, has a little green and purple, but let's just focus on these purple areas right here. I'm gonna turn that off and you can see in 1993, there's vegetation and in 19 and 2016, there's no vegetation. So it gives you sort of a, a really um, quick idea of where change has occurred and to some extent, you know, depending on the intensity of the color, the intensity of the change as well. So that's the end of the first part of this exercise. So then part three of our exercise is to use a transformation, um, which will apply to each date of our imagery and then uh, subtract one from the other to look at changes. Um, and that allows us to um, really get at, again, not only where the changes are and the extent of the changes, but to some extent, the intensity of the, of the changes and get that in one image. Um, as you, with the last exercise, we can visualize the change, but it's not easy to quantify that change in this particular approach. Um, this next approach, again, will be more for visualization um, and less for quantification, although we could do that a little bit more with this approach. Next week, we'll be able to actually quantify some of the change that we're seeing. So there's, if you look at the exercise, especially on page, um, and when uh, starting with part three, there's uh, lots of different kinds of transformations you can use. Uh, to do uh, image subtraction. There's the NDVI, uh, there's the EVI, um, and there's the normalized burn ratio. There's a lot of other transformations that you can do as well. It just depends on your study area um, and really what kind of change you want to be looking at. We're going to be using the normalized burn ratio. Um, even though we aren't looking at burns in this area, I really like the inclusion of the shortwave infrared band because it allows you to look at different aspects of vegetation, um, vegetation moisture, um, soil moisture, those kinds of things. So it gives it um, gives you a little more information than if you're just looking at the uh, near infrared and the red band. So we're going to be doing um, NBR transformations on each of the dates. That's the first thing that we're going to do. Um, before I do that, one, I have a little cleanup to do um, with my QGIS window. So I am just, just going to get rid of all of the imagery I don't need at this point. Just remove them. The other thing that I realize I've neglected to do is remind you all to save your project. And you can save it 
as whatever you want. I've actually saved it as um, exercise one, but make sure you do that. It'd probably be better to do that earlier, early on in our exercise. Um, but I'm going to actually just save it, uh, save it right now. I'll save it as exercise one. It says it already exists because I already um, made it once, but I'll just say yes. There we go. So just remember to save often if you want to do this over multiple days. It'll it'll save you a lot of um, pain later on. Okay, so I'm just going to move this clipped image, um, this NIR image, down kind of to the bottom because we aren't going to be using that very much um, either. So the first thing we're going to do is calculate the normalized burn ratio for both 1993 and then for 2016. So in order to do that, we need to use raster calculator. So we'll go up here to raster and then raster calculator. And the expression we're going to use, so again, we're using the near infrared band and the mid infrared band. Um, this is Landsat 5, six, because 1993, so that's band 4 and band 6. So our expression will be, and it's written in the exercise, so I recommend that you take a look at the exercise to get the, make sure you get the expression right. It's 1993 um, clip 4 minus 1993 band six, this is here, and then put the parentheses in there, divided by band four plus band six, band six. Okay, and I always forget this parentheses, so I'm gonna add it in there in this one at the end. Okay, and when you get the expression right, then down here it says expression valid. So I know I got it right. So now we need to give it a name. So this is in 1993. So we're gonna go to our exercise one folder um, and we're gonna call it NBR uh, 1993. Underscore 1993.tiff. And you save that. And everything else stays the same. And then you say, okay. So it automatically creates that TIFF um, pretty fast. As you can see, it's kind of hard to interpret that image. Uh, so we can change how it looks by going into the symbology again. And we'll keep it, we don't want it single band gray, we want to give it some color, so we'll call it single band pseudo color. And the color ramp is spectral, which is fine. Um, since we aren't going to be, we're going to be doing some subtraction with this imagery, so I'm not too worried about the, the values at this moment. Um, so I'm going to keep the values as they are and just say apply. We could, we could change the values to give it a little bit more meaning, but um, I'm just going to keep it like this for now. So when you look at this image, what you're seeing um, is basically wherever there's, there's red to sort of the orange and yellowy colors, that's, that's less vegetation. So if I were to compare that, say, with the 1993 image, you can see that those areas correspond with areas where there's no vegetation. So that's what we're looking at here. And then the blue and the green areas are areas where there are where there is vegetation. Okay. So we're going to do the same thing for the 2016 imagery. We're going to create an NBR image. Um, just remember that the band combinations are a little bit different for the 26 imagery since it's a Landsat 8. So instead of bands 4 and 6, you're going to use bands 5 and 7. So again, raster, raster calculator, um, 2016 band 5, well, we'll put the parentheses, band 5 minus band 7, parentheses, <coughs> divided by 
band five plus band seven. Uh, forgot the parentheses again. Okay. And then we'll call that NBR 2016 dot tiff up here. So I've already actually done that. So I'm going to just display it and bring it up, which I have right here, NBR 2016.tiff. So I'll open that up. And again, it will be um, it'll be grayscale. So we can actually give it the same scale. Um, as the 1993 image. If you right click on the 1993 image and you go to styles and you say copy style, you can go to the right click on the 2016 image, go to styles and say paste style. And there you go. So it has exactly the same uh, values and stretch that, and then you can kind of compare them to each other. If you click one off, one on and one off, you can see which areas are not vegetated and which areas are vegetated. But to make this really um, more helpful is subtracting one from the other. So the last thing we're going to do is go to the raster calculator again, and we're going to subtract the 1993 from the 2016. So we have NVR underscore 2016, and we subtract it from 19, or we subtract 1993 from 2016. So that's all that there is. And then we'll save the new um, output layer. We're going to call it NVR underscore diff, which is right here. So you can see I've already done that. And then you'll say OK and run it. So I'm just going to bring up that image. NBR underscore diff. And then open that. OK. Now again, it's in grayscale. So we want to um, turn it, give it some color. That makes, um, makes some sense. So we'll go to properties, symbology. And then we'll change the single band gray to um, single band to a color. We'll go ahead and use the same color ramp. But what we want to do now is make these values a little bit more meaningful. So if you remember from doing uh, from the lecture that I did, um, everything that is zero means there's been no change. Everything that is negative means that there's been um, some uh, decrease in vegetation and everything that's positive means that there's an increase in vegetation between 1993 and 2016. So what we'll want to do is really take a look at the values, the range of values in this particular image. And one way we can do that is by looking at the histogram of this image. So if I click on histogram, um, you'll see that a lot of the values center right around zero. A lot of them are negative, though, so um, not exactly on zero. So there's probably a lot of decrease in the vegetation. Um, and then you'll see the tails, uh, they start around negative 0.5 and positive 0.5. So we can use this information to change our um, our values and our symbology. So um, I think a really good, and we have this in our exercise as well, that if we have our breakpoints at, um, we could just double click on the value and we have the first one at uh, negative point, point 0.5. And then the next one will be negative 0.25. And then the third one will be zero. And then the next one will be positive 0.25. And the next one will be positive 
And then the labels, just so the labels come out okay when you display it, you'll want to copy, do the same thing on the labels. Um, and we'll go negative 0 0.5, negative 0 0.25, 0. You can also give these, um, you can give them names and stuff, but we'll just keep it like this. 0 0.25 and then 0.5. Okay. And now we'll say, okay. So now we have our change image. And what we're seeing here is the blue areas, kind of the blue and the light blue, uh, represent increases in vegetation, and all the red areas um, represent decreases of vegetation between 1993 and uh, 2016. And what I recommend that you do is sort of zoom into some of these places to just um, compare them. And I can do that right now. Like we can come into this area over here. Um, and and the other thing I want to point out in these images is you'll see some areas that are really sort of bright red and some areas that are sort of less red in that orange. Um, and that kind of shows you differences in intensity of the change and same with the blue areas. So some there's some big increases in vegetation and some sort of more subtle. So this gets, gives you information about some of the subtle changes um, that are occurring in the image. I'm going to turn these off, and then you can just use this to look at the um, at the raw imagery. Um, if you look at what's going on here, so increase in vegetation. This little blue spot right here, as you can see, in 1993 there was no vegetation there, and then by 2006 there's vegetation there. So you can see what's happening. But this technique um, really allows you to just focus in on the areas of change. Um, and then everything that's yellow is really no change. So uh, it's hard to, you'd be hard to quantify this at this point because it's a continuous image. It's not, um, it doesn't have um, classes that you can actually quantify, which is what we'll do next week. So we'll be able to create a classified image where you can actually quantify the change, but this allows you to really look at um, where the changes are occurring. And then one last point I want to make is that, again, we don't know the causes of these changes. So you need to get information about on the ground or some other way about what has actually caused the change. So that's the end of the exercise for today. I hope um, that you were either able to follow it or you'll be able to follow it later. Um, and if you have any questions while you're going through it later in the week, please feel free to, to email me and we can uh, we can walk through it and maybe address some of the issues um, during next week's webinar. I want to uh, give you our contact information, but we can open it up to questions that you might have. Um, and uh, otherwise, we want to thank you for joining us today. So here's our contacts again. This is um, my email address. Um, my colleagues, Amber McCollum's. If you have uh, general RSEC questions, you can contact Anna Prados. Um, and then again, our website is listed here. So we'll go ahead and take some questions now. So the first question that we have is, what is the use of satellite data during leaf off-season of rubber for plantation change detection? So that refers to the example that we showed in the, uh, the lecture part of this webinar. Um, and the answer is that um, rubber plantations, as do other kinds of vegetation, um, often have distinct periods with leaf on and leaf off. And so you can use that information um, especially if it's different than the surrounding vegetation, to identify the locations of those plantations um, with the satellite imagery. And that's what they did in that particular study. And the second question 
for change detection analysis, is it necessary to have same, the same spatial resolution of satellite data? Can we do analyses with spatial resolution of 20 meters and 30 meters? So if you have different spatial resolution data, you can do a visual analysis, um, but you can't do uh, like image subtraction um, or use any of the indices like we did in this exercise. You need imagery that have the same spatial resolution in order to do that. Question three, does one have to select different bands for to inspect different elements? So this goes back to some of the beginning um, webinars that we did, like the introduction to remote sensing, um, to answer some of these questions about visualizing the imagery. Um, so the selections of bands for visualizing imagery, it's a, it's a very personal preference. So if you're looking at vegetation, for example, then using the near infrared band and either the red or the green color band is important. So some people look like looking at vegetation as red, some people like looking at it as green, some people look like looking at true color. So again, I, I recommend that you review the intro to remote sensing webinar that tells you why you might look at different band combinations and the importance of it. So question four, can you share some guidelines on band stacking color selection? So again, it's, I think this question refers to what's similar to question three. So color selection is again, very, very personal. Um, and also, again, if you're looking at vegetation, then using the near infrared band in either the green color gun or the green band or the red band is really important. Does, does the data need to be atmospherically um, and radiometrically corrected for change detection? So that's a really good question. I'm going to actually type um, as I talk, just so we can, everyone can kind of see the answer. But it, it, it's best if the data can be um, corrected, but because you are looking at change between two images, um, oftentimes you don't need to do the correction if, if, it's, if it's hard for you to do it. Now, it could be that you'll see additional change um, you'll see some differences that may be due to differences in atmospheric conditions between the two years, um, so, which is why it's preferred that the data be corrected. Um, but because you're looking at differences, um, the differences in that atmospheric correction, in that atmospheric differences will be quite small. Um, but you just have to remember that when you're looking at, at change between the two times. I'll type that in there. Okay, so hopefully you can all see that answer. The question six, does the data need to be atmospherically? Okay, it's the same question as question five. Okay, question seven. Some of the raster bands are not showing in the calculator. Do you know why? First, it was only band seven, but now I've tried again. All the other apart from band one are missing. Actually, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, I probably have to see your specific um, QGIS. Uh, usually, if you're if you're going to the right directory, you should be able to see all the bands. Um, and as long as the bands are in there separately, you should be able to see them. So unfortunately, I'm not sure if I can help you with that. You know, what I recommend um, for you is that you take a screenshot and then email it to me and maybe we can troubleshoot a little bit. What are the equivalent bands in MODIS for this exercise? Um, so for doing the NBR, um, you know what, I'll have to look that up for you, exactly what the equivalent bands for MODIS. We can give you um, a web page. 
and maybe um, Selwyn or Amber, you guys can look up the web page that identifies the modus bands and um, put it in here. So what we're looking for is the shortwave infrared and the um, near infrared bands. How to measure, how do you measure precipitation influence on vegetation values in a change detection um, approach? That's also a very good question. Um, actually trying to measure, um, quantify uh, precipitation influence on vegetation is going to be really challenging unless you have, um, unless you have precipitation information for that area at the same time that the land, that the imagery was acquired. Um, certainly, if you were to look at a couple dates of, of imagery um, that had different precipitation amounts, you would physically see a difference, a graining difference between the two images. Um, and then you could subtract them and, you know, get some kind of, some kind of numbers, but if you're trying, um, if you're trying to quantify that, that's going to be a little bit more challenging. There's a question now. Could you please provide information for appears? Uh, yes, we will um, give you the link um, to answer ten in a second. So Amber, Selwyn, I'm hoping you guys can um, grab the link to appears and also um, for the modus bands as well. Which bands, question 11, which bands are useful for analyzing urban change detection? In subtropical areas, there's a lot of commonality between urban reflectance and driver. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, urban's always hard. Um, urban's hard because it gets mixed up with everything. So sometimes you can um, you can get at urban by looking using the that mid infrared band and that short wave infrared band um, because of um, kind of looking at moisture differences. Um, between urban, if there's trees, for example, in the urban area, um, that won't be in the dry riverbed. But I tell you, um, the difference between those two is often very challenging. And sometimes you have to use something else besides spectral reflectance to look at the differences um, between the two. So, for example, if you're, uh, if you have a river, um, if you have like a river layer, that's a vector layer, you can do some kind of a um, buffer from that river layer to try to get at, you know, where the dry river beds are versus urban reflectance. There's other ways you can kind of try to separate out those two, but sometimes spectrally you just can't do it. It's just very challenging. And I see that um, Selwyn put in the uh, link for peers. Thanks. For question 10. <laughs> uh, question 12. So your area of interest happened to be cloud free. Yes, it did. Um, we did that for a reason. <laughs> uh, uh, what if the area of interest had some cloud cover? So one of the things um, that we will mention, especially next week we'll mention, um, is you if you have clouds in your study area, you need to do a cloud mask. And luckily, um, the surface reflectance data from Landsat imagery includes cloud information. So you can use that to actually mask out those areas. Um, unfortunately, you can't see um, underneath the clouds. You just can't do it. Um, and so you have to mask out that data using that cloud information from surface reflectance. Um, if you don't have that surface reflectance data or the cloud data, then you have to create your own cloud mask. And there's various ways um, there's various ways to do that, um, and we can give you some information on that later. So 
So there's a question here. If I want to evaluate loss and gain annually, will this, methodolo will this methodology allow you to do that? Yes, of course. This will allow you to look at loss and gain annually as long as you have imagery that um, matches the period of time that you want to look at. Um, that's the key here. Um, also, probably as I mentioned before, and sometime in 2019, um, we'll be doing a webinar on time series analysis, which really looks at, enables you to look at um, closer time steps, so whether it's annually or monthly or something like that. Um, and it allows you to um, quantify that change in, in closer time steps. This You can do it with this approach as well. It just takes a little bit longer time to do it. The question, can we identify the tree types, like big and small trees on Landsat data? That's a good question. Um, trying to get at tree types is always really challenging. Um, using Landsat data um, in particular, uh, sometimes if they if they are spectrally different from each other, so if the big tree types uh, look spectrally different than the small tree types, then then yes. Um, oftentimes, though, trying to detect differences between different tree types is very challenging because they are so spectrally similar. How do you explain the use of severity of fire to make change detection? So as I explained earlier, um, we used that ratio. So the burn severity ratio, the NBR that we used, um, is simply a ratio. It allows you to look at burns, but it also allows you to look at any change, anything about other characteristic of vegetation. So we could have easily used an NDVI, um, we could have used a moisture index. There's all kinds of different indices but that we could have used. But I like using the burn ratio because it includes the mid-infrared band, which allows you to look at things like vegetation moisture a little bit better than just using the near-infrared band. So the burn ratio is typically used for burns but it is simply a ratio. It's a vegetation ratio. So you can use it for more than just burns. So there's a question about using about the more subtle land degradation detection. Um, it is, it is harder to look at that. This approach that we use today certainly allows you to look at more subtle land degradation. Um, although you can't quantify it, it really is uh, more of a visual analysis. So remember when we saw the darker colors versus the lighter colors, the lighter colors um, tend to be a more subtle land degradation. Um, next week when we do uh, classification, that approach will also allow you to look at more subtle degradation as opposed to the big um, changes. So again, here, question 17 says, is it possible to make quantitative conclusions from values um, in the NBR? Um, so again, this is a continuous image, so it's going to be really difficult to quantify it. We can actually, uh, next week, we will be doing a land cover classification. So each class, each class will indicate some level of change, and that we can quantify. So question 18, um, could you explain more why you use NBR to detect changes when the NBR is an index? So I explained why we use NBR before. Um, an index will give you often more information than a single band might. So if you're just doing image subtraction, you're, you can only use a single band. 
to do image subtraction. So you could choose, say, the near-infrared band and just subtract that and get very similar information to what we use. But if you use an index, that actually allows you to subtract two bands, but it has more information in it. So the NBR index, for example, has the shortwave infrared band and the near infrared band. Um, and, or you can use NDVI, which is the near infrared band and the red band. So if you're doing the subtraction approach, you have to use a single band. You can use a single band or can, you can use an index that gives you more information, which is why we use it. So question 19, can we subtract other changes to display only a change in one land cover type? So I'm not exactly sure what this question means. Um, so I think it's asking, can we just look at, for example, only vegetation change or only urban change? So these approaches don't allow you just to look at one change. It, it looks at change across the whole image. So anywhere there's change, you're going to see, <clears throat> in this case, either the red or the purple or the green. There's no way to sort of separate out that change. And in most cases, it's going to be really hard um, to do that in any approach because you, because Landsat or because satellite imagery is continuous across a landscape, unless you just select out the vegetation ahead of time, you're going to get change wherever it's occurring. If we want, question 20 says, if we want to observe the changes of the surface of the soil, is it possible to do that remote sensing data? That's a good question, possibly. Um, it depends on how large the soil is. Um, I mean, if you have soil with no vegetation on it, you might be able to see changes in the surface of the soil. It's going to be a very subtle change. And it depends if the surface of the soil is changing because of difference in moisture or difference in soil type. Um, usually for something like that, you might need hyperspectral data, not multispectral data, because the spectral differences between the different soils, whatever is happening to those soils, may be too small for something like Landsat to detect. Oh, here's a good question. So question 21, pixels in Landsat 8 images have different radiometric resolution than the previous series. Yes. So how can we make image difference? That's a great question. So Landsat 8 images have, um, have are 12 bit and Landsat 5 images are 8 bit. So we, in this particular exercise, we use the surface reflectance data. So all the imagery, um, both the five and the eight, had been converted to surface reflectance. So ha they had the same value range. And that's important. Uh, that's an important thing to continue if you, to consider. If you didn't have the surface reflectance, one way to get around um, that is to do these image ratios. So compare an NDVI from one date with an NDVI from another date, um, because you're looking at the ratio of the pixel values, which NDVI, for example, no matter what the uh, radiometric resolution is of the imagery, will always go between negative one and positive one. So that's one way of sort of getting around doing surface reflectance data. But in this exercise, we use surface reflectance, um, which then both images have the same values. 
Here's a question. What should I do when I deal with change analysis in grassland, which may be caused by delayed rainfall and not anything permanent? How do I take control of that? You know, that grasslands are a really tough system um, to do remote sensing in because they are so sensitive to uh, ra rainfall and um, drought and things like that. So you really have to think about what you're looking at if you're trying to look at, say, grazing land degradation, you know, due to overgrazing or something like that. You really have to look at the rainfall occurrences and try to time your imagery um, around sometimes when the rainfall might be consistent. That's a very difficult um, thing to do in grasslands, and it's always been a challenge. Um, we might be able to get you some references to some ways to look at change in grasslands. Um, so we'll, um, if, if you can email me, um, I'll try to get you some references on that. Can you use the top of atmosphere product for change detection? Um, you, you can, but just remember that the, the values, the radiometric values, um, between Landsat 5 and Landsat 8 um, will still be different. So that's why it's best to get to surface reflectance. Does Sentinel-2 data give a better land cover change than Landsat? Um, it depends what you mean by better. Um, it certainly has a higher spatial resolution, so you might get more details then maybe Landsat can give you, but it, it really is dependent on the type of change that you're looking for. Can this principle be used um, around in coastal vegetation to differentiate between aquaplanktons and the land surface vegetation in that area? That's a very good question. I believe it can be used. Um, I know that there are similar indices that are used to detect um, coastal vegetation, um, especially on the surface, so chlorophyll and things like that. Um, and I believe you can use the same approach to look at changes in the amount of chlorophyll um, in the coastal regions. So there's a question here, what differences have you noticed with this method and that of class light? So um, I'm afraid I don't know what class light is, what that method is. So maybe you can, whoever asked that question can clarify a bit more. Oh, great. Amber has found the um, link to the class light method. So we just haven't used those techniques yet. Maybe that's something we can look into and um, think about doing at a future webinar. Thanks for the information on that. So here's somebody who wants to look at landslides. Will the same band as used in this exercise be helpful? Be helpful? Um, I would say yes, the same band would be helpful. Although I encourage you, all of you, for any of your applications to try different band combinations. Um, this, this is a good one. I, I really, again, like the inclusion of the near infrared band and the um, shortwave infrared band. But um, every application is different. So you can try this band, but I actually encourage you to experiment a little bit and try other band combinations that might bring out whatever um, change that you're interested in a little better. That's the fun part about doing remote sensing um, and working with this software is there's not always one answer to everything. So question 28 is asking about the best change detection method for detecting damage to crops. Um, again, I think NDVI would probably be good for that one. Any of the vegetation indices, NDVI, um, NBR. Um, again, I really encourage you all to experiment a little bit with different vegetation indices. And in the exercise, 
we've given you ideas for looking at different ve vegetation indices for your study area. So usually every, anything to do with vegetation, um, the you know NDVI, NBR will be useful. But please, please um, experiment for your own study area. What machine, what can machine learning techniques bring to change detection? So next week we will be using uh, random forest to classify change. And uh, that's a really great way to uh, use sort of a supervised classification approach um, and, and use machine learning to identify where change is in an image. It's actually easier, I think, uh, to use that approach to identify change than it is to do a land cover classification because you have fewer classes. And I think it's easier for random forest, uh, those kinds of approaches to identify change. Here's a question, um, is the conversion of rainforest into oil palm plantation well detectable with change detection methods? Um, so that was the example that we showed in our lecture and they used um, differences in um, leaf on and leaf off to look at that. So it depends on the surrounding vegetation. Uh, oftentimes, you know, once an area has been cleared, you can detect it then and see new plants coming up. Um, it really depends on your study area. And I know there are lots of projects out there and publications that um, address this issue. So maybe we can we can find some of those publications for you. So there's a question, is the extensification versus intensification detection possible through change detection? So that is a very broad question. <laughs> um, if you could be more specific as to the extensification or intensification of what? So what is changing? Um, and really to answer any question about whether remote sensing or satellite imagery can look at change, you have to think about whether there will be spectral differences between the change you're trying to detect. If there are no spectral differences, if you cannot see a spectral difference between one time and another with change, then you will not be able to see that change with satellite imagery. Oh, this is great. Amber just found a really great reference uh, for using remote sensing to look at oil palms. So we'll be uh, posting these questions and answers um, on our website too. So you'll be able to go back and take a look at some of these um, answers as well as the references. Okay, so question 31 looks like it's um, clarified here. Uh, talking about agricultural change, so from grasslands to crops. So again, the thing to think about is whether you're going to see some spectral change. And you can look at an image without doing any analysis to determine whether you think you might see change in the satellites or not. Oftentimes, grassland spectrally looks very different uh, than crops. So without knowing the area that you're interested in, I would say it would be most likely that you'll be able to see a change from grassland to crops. But again, I need to, I would need to look at the area to determine that for sure. So question 32, can we use a threshold to separate vegetated from non-vegetated areas in each year? Then do image subtraction to get a quantitative ass assessment of changes in vegetation. So 
So I'm trying to figure out exactly what you're asking. So are if you are saying to do before you do the subtraction to try to separate vegetated from non-vegetated, then you'd have to do some kind of processing to get to that point. So whether it's a land cover classification of two different years and then subtract those, that's possible, but it's not preferred. Um, and the reason is if you do a land classification on two different years and subtract those, you're not really getting at subtle differences between the two years, in the changes between the two years. A better way is to really use the raw imagery or to do some kind of index like we did in today's exercise and subtract those. The downside to that approach is that it's very difficult to quantify. Next week, when we do a land cover classification, we put both images together and we do a land cover classification, then it's easier to quantify that change. All right, everyone, I think we're going to wrap up the session for today. I want to thank everyone for attending. We had a lot of folks on today, so I hope it was helpful for you. And again, I want to remind you that if you have any questions, I will try to bring up our Uh, contact information again. And uh, please feel free to email us. There we go. So there's our contact information. Please feel free to email us during the week with any questions you might have. And please tune in next week, next Friday, uh, when we will be having a um, exercise, a lecture and exercise, again, on advanced change detection using classification um, where you can actually quantify the change. So thanks again, everybody, and um, we look forward to talking with you again next week.